OK, so this is the second segment for lecture two, where we talk about Mohr's circle. Uh, previously, we've uh, worked out the stress and normal and shear stress required uh, on an inclined plane when we make a cut in our little elemental cube. And we've studied what the special values are in these two equations uh, as we vary theta, what the max and minimum are, where they occur for both sigma, when those max and minimum we call the principal stresses, and there when tor disappears altogether and becomes zero, and the values when tor is maximized and minimized as well, maximum shear stress condition. And more circle is an interesting way of finding those without having to do a lot of algebra. Um, so we take equations 9 and 10 from before, and we rearrange them. And what we're going to do when we rearrange them is, this is now equation 9 becomes 28. What we're going to do is we're going to take that over the other side. So we'll have a sigma minus a half sigma x plus sigma y. And that's going to be equal to this bit here, is equal to a half sigma x minus sigma y cos 2 theta plus tor xy sine 2 theta. And we can take equation 10 and rearrange it to get equation 29. And that, uh, well, we'll just take equation 10 as it is, uh, which is tor is equal to a half um, minus a half sigma x minus sigma y sine 2 theta plus tor xy cos 2 theta. Now, if we square those two and add them together, what do we get? This is going to be another bit of mathematical magic. So if we square that, we get a sigma minus a half sigma x plus sigma y, all squared, plus tall squared, is equal to, now, we're going to get one of those cos squared, and we'll get, notice when we square it, we'll get one of those sine squared, so we'll have, uh, and cos squared plus sine squared is one, right? So we'll have a half, of sigma x minus sigma y, sigma x minus sigma y. Tidy it up a bit. All squared. And when we square and add, we'll have one of those times sine theta cos 2 theta times tor x y squared. So, uh, sorry, when we square and add, we'll have a sine squared 2 theta of those and a cos squared 2 theta of those. So that's also going to be 1 plus a tor x y squared. And we'll also have the cross term, so we'll have twice that times that, plus twice that times that. But they're only different by a minus sign, so they cancel out. So we'll have plus a half sigma x minus sigma y, tor xy, cos 2 theta, sine 2 theta, times 2, that was plus, and then we'll have minus that again, and it all goes away, ha 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 ha, goodbye. And the big white rubber comes and goes, ba bum. Now, this is the equation of a circle. Yeah? It's the equation of a circle. That is, it's the equation of a circle with an form x minus h or sigma minus h squared plus tor squared, so the axes in my circle are sigma and tor, is equal to some radius squared. And that radius is equal to sigma x minus sigma y over 2 plus tor xy squared. And that was tor max. that we had. That is uh, equation 24. So that is a circle with radius tor max centered at 
a point which is the average of the two normal stresses, this point here. Okay, so what we're saying is, if I draw it up now, if we draw a circle whose axes are sigma and tor, if we have a circle, its centre will be a half sigma x plus sigma y. Its radius will be equal to tor max. Then, that's called mole circle, and that's a way of drawing out a stress state that enables us to find the shear stresses. So let's look at how we use that. And it's actually really very simple. So I'm going to draw it even bigger now. Rub that out. So we'll do lots of examples of this. The key one, here though, is just see it graphically with most circles. So I've got a stress state which is equal to sigma x, sigma y, tor xy, and three other values, whatever they are. I don't know, call them dashes. And I'm going to rotate it about z by an angle theta. Now, what I do is I draw that on a set of axes sigma and tor. And I draw first a point here, say, at sigma y, comma, tor. I draw another point here, say, at sigma x, comma, tor. Let's assume, for the sake of argument here, that sigma x is bigger than sigma y. Okay, and they're both positive for this illustration. Then I draw a circle between them. The centre of the circle is at the average of sigma x and sigma y, a half sigma x plus sigma y. The radius of the circle, this radius here, is equal to, well, this number here is equal to uh, a half sigma x plus sigma y minus sigma y. So that's a half sigma x minus sigma y. This number here is tor, so this radius is equal to the square root of tor. So I put some xy's in. Tor xy squared plus one half sigma x minus sigma y squared. Okay? And if I brought the half outside and put a 4 there, that would be the same as the equation we had before, which is the same thing. So, this radius is then equal to tor max. So, if I want to know the principal stresses, they'll be equal to a half sigma x plus sigma y plus the radius, and equal to a half sigma x plus sigma y minus the radius. And they're at positions, comma, naught, of no shear stress. So that's sigma 1, and this one's sigma 2. And when we're at maximum shear, we're here at sigma x plus sigma y for the normal stress. So we're at an equation on this graph, sigma x plus sigma y, comma r, comma the maximum shear stress. And the same is true down there. Now... The only funny thing about this circle and this set of axes is that the shear stress is positive in both directions. So this maximum shear describes a stress state that is a half sigma x plus sigma y, a half sigma x plus sigma y, tor max, tor max. And all of my z ones have stayed the same, so to make it a real stress state it has to be 3D. So that's the tor max condition, 
and the principal stress condition is a half sigma x plus sigma y plus r, a half sigma x plus sigma y minus r, naught, naught, dash, 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 whatever the values were for z. So that's the principal condition, and this is the max shear condition. And if it was really a 2D, all these other ones in Z would be zero, right? So forget it. Um, so that's how Moore's circle works. And it means that if you can draw a circle where you can find the radius and you can find the maximum shear and everything is fine. So the only funny thing about it is that because of the squares in those equations, then tor is in effect positive in both directions, which is weird. Okay. And also the angles are double because the equations there were in sine 2 theta and cos 2 theta. So if I want to know the angle between the principal stresses and the maximum shear stress, that angle, well, it's 90 degrees in Moore's circle, which is 2 theta is 90, is 45 degrees in real life, so theta is 45. So the angle between the principal stress and the maximum shear condition is 45 degrees, which is what we said earlier. And the angle here between uh, the principal stress, the original stress condition and the principal stress condition here, this angle here, 2 theta, that angle there, that angle is given by tor xy divided by uh, the radius, or well, the sine of it is given by, the tan of it is given by opposite over adjacent, so we can say, let's go up here, tan 2 theta is equal to the opposite, so that's tor xy divided by the adjacent, which is a half sigma x minus sigma y. Okay. Uh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Which is what we said earlier. Right? So it all works out. Um, you just have to remember that angles in Moore's circle are two theta angles. Now I'm just going to clean up this drawing for a moment and then make one other point. So the last point to make is how to deal with negative shear stresses. And for this, we have a convention. So if sigma x is bigger than sigma y, tor xy is positive, we have a stress uh, element that looks like that on the little elemental square. And our Moore's circle looks like this. We've got sigma x, which is bigger than sigma y, to comma tor xy here, and sigma y, tor xy there. And we draw them in this sense with... Uh, the, the angle being like that, um, and if tor xy is positive. And then the angle here going this way anti-clockwise, so that's anti-clockwise, is the angle to get to sigma 1 and sigma 2. And as we do that, we increase the normal stress as we go around here, Go around here, there's the stress state there, there's another stress state, that's the principal stress state, here's another one. So as we go up, as we rotate up by this angle anti-clockwise, then sigma 1 gets bigger, that's the one that was sigma x, and sigma 2, that's the one that was sigma y, gets smaller. So then we've rotated an angle here that's anti-clockwise, and so there's sigma 1 that was sigma x, and there's sigma 2 that was sigma y rotated by this angle theta in reality that was 2 theta in Moore's circle. So then what happens is you keep rotating. If you rotated to here, you could rotate to somewhere where you had the same sigma x. You'd have rotated by another 2 theta in Moore's circle. You'd have the same values, but tor xy would now be negative in effect. You'd have rotated by the full uh, 2 theta again. So what we have is if you draw it here, this quadrant and this quadrant are negative tor xy, and this quadrant and this quadrant are positive tor xy. And that's the convention. So if you're rotating anti-clockwise from a positive tor xy, then uh, you're decreasing the shear stress. And if you keep on going, then you get into a negative shear stress situation. Hey, it's just a axes and convention thing. Um, so if you have a negative shear stress, you should draw it like this, and then you would rotate a clockwise angle, or a negative angle, to get to your principal stress condition. 
and that's the way in which you handle them. That also makes sense in terms of the way tan graphs out. So that's the last little bit, is dealing with the convention on negative shear stresses and how we approach those. But by and large, as I said earlier, we don't think about negative shear stresses because they're awkward and it's only a minus sign. And really, who gives a monkey's about minus sign? So that's my circle. Probably the best way to look at my circle is to do some problems. So that's what we're going to do next, is we're going to start looking at how to solve stresses in bodies. And then we'll bring all this together to solve a few 2D stress problems. And that's where we'll go uh, in the third lecture. So we'll start applying this. Uh, so see you then.